everyone, my name is Zeynep Tufekci, uh, as you can see, and I'm TechSocial on Twitter, and as David kindly mentioned, I also blog. And I'm going to be talking not necessarily about a single country, although I will be concentrating on Egypt uh, in the end, but I'm going to be talking about how I see a new media ecology, uh, a different kind of uh, media configuration is changing some of the dynamics for collective action. So uh, as uh, Lena started her talk, we've had 20, 30, 40 year dictatorships in Middle East and North Africa, something political scientists call durable authoritarianism. And the question here is, these are usually deeply unpopular, unsuccessful regimes. They, by any measure you look at, they haven't been able to e e greatly improve the well-being of their citizens, especially commensurate with the resources they have. And they're, um, it's hard to tell uh, during the rev uh, before the revolution, but every indication we have post-revolution is that these people were not, the dictators were not popular. As I joke in Egypt, it seems that even Mubarak's dog did not like him. Uh, so how did this man stay in power for so long? How did Ben Ali stay in power for decades? How did Gaddafi stay in power for four decades? I think that's a more real question than why did these regimes fall? Why did they not fall sooner? And that happens by what I would call a collective, by creating a collective action problem. What's a collective action problem? When if you could all cooperate to solve a problem, but when there's a high cost for any one of the people to do something, and a very high cost of failure, and if it's hard to communicate and organize, you have a collective action problem. So. I mean, imagine the case that uh, I hope nothing like this ever happens anywhere near here or anywhere. Imagine the case where we hear of a lone gunman killing 80, 100 people, right? Obviously, if everybody could at the time crowd around that person, he may be able to kill 12 or 20, but not 80. How does it happen? Because it's very hard to organize something like that, and it's very hard to get together uh, because that person can extract very high punishment on a single person. That's why in collection, uh, I mean, there are other things that go into the what we call the durable authoritarianism, ethnic divisions, patronage systems, but creating a collective action problem is one of the key mechanisms through which these regimes stay in power. In fact, that is why something like torture is common in these regimes, not because these dictators are personally sadistic, they may or may not be, but something like torture is a crucial mechanism for creating a very high disincentive for any single person to participate uh, in in action against the regime. And you don't really need to sort of, you can tell this by thinking about it, but if we do like, you know, you do game theory and you know, you do sort of these models, what you find is if you are able to coordinate and communicate with other players in a game where there's a collective action problem as I described, where it requires mass participation, then the game really changes. That's why TV stations used to be uh, very important. Now, how do you create a collective action problem? And I really don't have to go on long because Lena described it beautifully. That's how you create a collective action problem. You create censorship. You restrict means of organization and you create a high cost of dissent through torture and jail. And you then minimize the potential for cascades to take over. By cascade, I mean something kind of, like think of a dam bursting. That's a cascade, and you can sort of model how these things happen. And if you're a dictator, and if you've been in power for 30 years, and you're unpopular, you really need to make sure there is not a trickle coming out of that dam, because if there's a trickle, then the rest does come. 
Uh, now, let me describe, uh, see, it's nice to have like models and theories and I could show you all sorts of game theory calculations and everything. And I always feel bad about my presentations because I'm an academic. And usually for academics, if you can read my presentation, that's a success, right? It's like if it's not tiny font. Uh, but everybody has these beautiful things. So I decided the way to explain collective action problem, the easiest way would be to show you. There was that ant that stood up to me. Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one ant. <laughs> <laughs> one ant. <laughs> So here, grasshoppers have let one ant escape with some grain, and they're saying, let that one ant go. Who cares? Let one ant escape. It's just one ant with um, one little grain. So the dictator grasshopper, the smart grasshopper, is going to explain why that's not a good hey, idea. You're right. It's just one ant. Yeah, boys. They're puny. Hmm, puny? Say, let's pretend this grain is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? <laughs> nope. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding? <laughs> well, how about this? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? So there you go. Uh, <laughs> that's your collective action problem without any, you know, <laughs> formulas or numbers. And it's really easy. That's exactly how it works. Um, because, see, this is what we forget, is that a state is a resource-constrained actor. There may not be institutional checks the way we have in better democracies about what a state can do, say, in the Middle East or in places like China. but. Even the most brutal state cannot effectively jail a million people all at once. There is no state that can actually withstand coordinated action by majority of its citizens in a stable manner. Yes, they can kill a lot of people. Yes, it can turn into a civil war, but the kind of stable authoritarianism can only exist if you can keep a collective action problem alive for your citizens. And that is why social media, along with Al Jazeera and other ecology, is a game changer. Now, I want to be careful here. I am obviously, I'm, I'm emphasizing the role social media played. That doesn't mean I don't understand and I'm not really um, uh, that any of us are ignorant of the street protests or the amazing bravery. And I take that as the background. I've seen it, I've talked to many people in my travels, and I have firsthand heard of the stories of bravery that uh, it took to get rid of these regimes. What I'm trying to explain is why in 2011 that bravery did work when previous attempts were crushed. So I'm not trying to take away credit, I'm just trying to explain in a complicated multi-causal system what role did one particular element play. And there, uh, I think uh, by creating what I call a end run around the WACA protest model that regimes in the Middle East had perfected, and you see this also in countries like China, where as soon as a protest pops up, the regime comes down like a ton of bricks on it so that it cannot spread, so that it cannot obtain a national identity. And Lena talked a little bit about the Gafsa protest, which I do know they also didn't have the same national demands and character, but they were effectively censored. And there were such protests before also in Egypt. Egyptians have been organizing for at least a decade, if not more, attempting again and again and again, and a lot of the protests had been crushed. 
um, just whack a protest. That's what uh, authoritarian regimes play. The other thing they do is uh, another thing that happens is what we call preference falsification in political science. That's when everybody has a particular view privately, but do not express it publicly because they're afraid. I mean, imagine if everybody here is very bored right now and they think, will she shut up? But it's not polite for you to get up and say, will you shut up, right? So you're all quiet. But maybe if one of you got up, then everybody would get up. Now, I hope that's not a good example, but it's the kind of example of how you know, you can have a talk where all the audience is about to go to sleep, but nobody gets up and says something, right? You have a hidden preference that's actually shared by everyone, but nobody expresses it. Now, how do you do an end run around that? Well, if you have a Twitter back channel and people start saying, my God, I wish you'd shut up, you can start a cascade very quickly. And no, I'm not going to be checking that. Uh, so, because perception is part of what shapes reality. And if you have a hidden preference problem, which you do in an authoritarian regime, if people start being able to signal, a cascade can occur fairly quickly. And that you, you saw that with some Facebook pages and partly Twitter, you mostly played, even though it was a more minority, Twitter played more as a bridge role. I think Lena's definitely correct that Facebook and Twitter had different roles. Twitter was more used to link to the outside and Facebook was more internally. But it's what people used to um, communicate. So what does social media in this new media ecology change? And I use the word new media ecology for me. It has three legs. One is satellite channels. The other is the cell phone that have video capabilities, and the third is internet, Facebook, social media. So I think of a new media ecology with three legs. So what do they change? They make it harder to censor. We talked a little bit of that. They alter the shape of the network. I will talk about this. And it makes it easier for people to signal their preferences quickly and all together. And that's a big deal, because if you're slowly signaling then the regime can whack a protest. It also helps document torture and all of that. And also what Lena talked about allows for coordination and information flow during protests. So all of these are, so traditionally this, this is what you have. You have a one-to-many network and you have the television and everybody doing, and here you are protesting. You know, if you've been an activist, you've been here. You know, if you're older than 18, you've been here. You're ignored, sorry. Uh, that's why they're the first target in a coup. I come from a country which used to have coups, we don't have them anymore, which is nice. And you'd wake up and on television there'd be this, there's, we had a coup anchor and we had a coup song, I kid you not, there was this patriotic song. And if you turned on your television and that guy was on TV and that song was playing, you were like, oh, okay honey, let's go try to find some bread. There's a coup and there'll be you know, some sort of um, problem. This is the Egyptian uh, television network, which protesters also circled during the protest. But see, the thing was, between Al Jazeera and citizen journalists, this wasn't as crucial anymore. This wasn't as key, it was still lying, but you could do an end run around it, which is also what Lena talked about. So epidemiology, the spread of disease, and how you, you know, sort of study of spread of disease, tells us that the shape of the network and the speed with which a disease spreads is key to whether or not you can quarantine it successfully. And if you're an authoritarian regime, you look at a protest as if it were an infection. It's an illness you're trying to root out. So uh, isolate sensor, we talked about this. So let's see, it worked for decades too. And let's say you have a network like this. And this is what human networks tend to be, they're clumpy. You know, there are social networks and usually there are these hubs or, you know, little sort of choke points. And you can isolate this part from that part by just sort of focusing on all those bridges or you can, you know, do this. And they have done this. But what if your network looks like this? Now how are you going to isolate it? What are you going to do? This is a problem. And this is a many-to-many -many network and this is a problem for a dictatorship and social media by allowing this kind of lateral connectivity and so fast. You know, in uh, Egypt, uh, there were five million Facebook users before the revolution. That's a large number. Yes, it's not the whole population, but social movements 
are never the whole population and plus there are a lot of people who have families and the young ones will be on Facebook. So you don't really need to have the whole population for it to be effective. You need a large number. So it can't be a few thousand. Uh, ideally, it's a good chunk of the population, at which point you get these critical effects of cascades and diffusion. So case of Egypt, I, I'm, I'm not gonna like give you guys a lot of details about it, I'm sure you read. Persistent efforts, uh, of course it's a multi-factor revolution. I'm just, as I, I wanna emphasize, I am only looking at one angle because this is a new angle and an interesting angle, but there is the youth elite dissatisfaction, there was a labor movement, there were strikes, rising food prices, the example of Tunisia, uh, lots of great articles being written about all of these. So to understand the whole revolution, you'd have to really put in all of this, but in you know, one talk in 20 minutes, and my field of expertise, I'm not gonna talk about them, but I just wanna emphasize. Now, I wanna show you guys some data. This is just under review now in an academic journal, and this is actually a pretty fascinating data set. It's not really made public yet. Uh, we have survey from protesters in Tahrir during the protest in the month of February, during the unrest, a uh, bunch of very uh, enterprising, um, well, uh, partly grad students, but also you know professionals uh, from the Engine Room Research Collective went and did a survey of 1,000 prote 1,050 protesters using snowball sampling, which basically means because it was still a dangerous time, they asked people to recommend people, so it's not a random sample for those social science people. It's a snowball sample, uh, so representativeness is limited, but just take it as representing a thousand people in Tahrir during the month of February. And because even as that, it's fascinating. Okay, so I'm not gonna like give you like tons of numbers, but let me just tell you that if you look at it, the, of this survey, 90% of the women in the survey and 77% of the men in the survey had internet at home, which is very high. This is a well-off population, and I think the gender difference is very interesting because for women to be in the public space during a protest in Egypt is they were even more privileged. And only a third of them had attended protests before. So this is 1,000 people and 90% of the women and 77% of the men had internet at home, and it's a, as observers said, it's a novel group. Here's the interesting numbers. If you combine them, about 50% used Facebook for protest purposes. About 18% of the women and 11% of the men used Twitter for uh, protest purposes to disseminate uh, about the news. And they also used emails and, of course, satellite TV, which to me, like half, about half the population of the sample is using this tool as a means to disseminate information about the protest. That's pretty big because Facebook in Arabic was introduced only in 2009. So a new tool is playing a major role. Now, I'm not gonna explain this one. This is a logistic regression. I'm just putting it out there, any social science people there. It is looking at the likelihood that these people attended their first day of protest. And what it says is that people who were social media users were a lot more likely to show up for protests in Tahrir on the first day. And why is that important? Because the worst position to be in a dictatorship or a durable authoritarian regime is to show up for a protest in small numbers. If you're gonna show up, you wanna show up in large numbers. Because if you live in a state where the costs of failure are so high, showing up in small numbers can be deadly. When I was in Egypt, the people I talked to were telling me of their decision to go to Tahrir on the first day, and it went something like this. And then I emailed a couple of my friends abroad and told them, if I'm killed, please take care of my family, and I went to Tahrir. This is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of dedication and bravery and cost people undertook to go. And the worst position to be is to show up there and be only 150 people. Because if you're gonna do this, you better be 50,000, 100,000, a million. And the social media users were more likely to be there on that very first day, which is a significant thing. They could overwhelm 
the state. So um, about, again, uh, for social, uh, social scientists here, uh, yes, we have the percentages. Uh, about 25% of the sample used Facebook to upload pictures. And overall, about 49%, about, about half the sample produced some level of visuals. What does that mean? It means, forget about whether is the, is the sample representative or not. Let's just assume it's not, and let's just assume it's only about these people. It means there were 500 citizen activists, journalists on the ground. I, this is a game changer. You would have a protest and you'd be lucky if one journalist got in under censorship conditions. And now you have hundreds and hundreds of citizen activist journalists. It makes it very hard to censor. Uh, so fa and Facebook was the primary mechanism for disseminating visual content. And a lot of people told me that the Iranian revolution, the Green Revolution, was the revolution, even though it failed, it was a major demonstration effect to the region to say, oh, wait, we can control our message. Um, so the producers are uh, protesters, too. So the producers, the people who produced visuals, were also more likely to be there on the very first day. So a new kind of activist citizen journalist has risen up in just a few years. Amazing sea change for compared to five, ten years ago. The, I was, uh, when I was in Cairo, there was a protest. Um, these are, this is the May 25th protest. Uh, and I want to sort of, I took this picture because it's the new media ecology. On that eighth floor uh, of that apartment, that's Ayman uh, of Al Jazeera and his camera. And the story of how he got there is really funny because he was like knocking on doors trying to find a place to put his camera. And like everybody was scared, so they weren't, they didn't want to let a camera in their balcony. So he sweet talks the doorman into letting him into that building and he's knocking on all the doors. And on the eighth floor, he comes like, and this guy opens the door and the whole house is this big mess of clutter. And there's this guy, you know, kind of half awake wearing a Che t-shirt. And Ayman's like, you want to make history? The guy's like, OK. And the rest was history, because that Al Jazeera camera was crucial. But it was not there by itself. Al Jazeera also, uh, I have some um, guy documenting this stuff. It was this feedback, right? Al Jazeera uploading social media, and also Al Jazeera broadcasting to the whole region, and then more people getting out. And by the time. Mubarak cut off the internet, it was the cascade had begun, so it was no longer relevant. If anything, it probably made more people angry. So this is just pictures of people documenting. Uh, and I saw this all the time in protests. I just see always, and this is this guy's, uh, I think he was broadcasting via bamboo, so he's just holding up his uh, laptop and these were billboards. This is just different. So when you ask people, where did you first hear of the protest? This is our sample again. About half of the people heard it face to face, showing you the importance of the face to face networks. But another 28% heard it through Facebook, which is also pretty amazing. Again, a very new technology. And you see this interaction. And one thing I really want to sort of correct is, was it digital versus not? I, I, the digital is part of this world. Online and offline are integrated. They're not mutually exclusive. It's one network. People talk to each other, and then they Facebook or tweet, and they talk on the phone, and then they go talk to each other in person. It's not like an either or situation. The thing to understand is this complex interconnected network, and that's why I never say virtual versus real. The digital versus non-digital, fine, but they're all real and they're all part of one world. So conclusion, the key to collective action is creating these cascades and being able to sort of, if you think in epidemiological terms, to break a quarantine and protest size and speed is important that way. Visual production is very important and documenting and circumventing censorship is very important. And Facebook, Twitter, blogs, all of those, you know, there's a lot more data. They are a crucial part of the story. But as uh, Lena talked about, and I'm sure others will talk about, they're really good for creating a big cascade to get rid of an unpopular person. It's still not clear whether they're going to be 
as useful in democracy building, civil society, all sorts of things. It gets a lot more complicated there to build an alternative to the society and all of that. So I'm not really, I'm not dismissing all the problems there. I'm just saying if in an unpopular regime, these are, this seems to be a key part of the story. And we'll see how it plays out, Tunisia, Egypt, and all of that, and the surveillance aspects and all those are things. But this is not, to take away, I mean, this goes without saying. I, I really don't like this. It was it this or that revolution. Obviously, you know, tools do not take away from the amazing bravery, courage we witnessed. But it's important to understand the role of these tools rather than getting stuck in binaries of was it this, was it that, because as people will talk about um, later, and as I sort of like to emphasize, the hardest problems facing humanity right now are collective action problems. Things like our health of our democracies, the crisis in our financial system, global warming, they're all collective action problems. They're problems where there's an individual disincentive for everyone, but it requires mass participation. It's as if, you know, some space aliens came and said, let's design some problems people are bad at solving, haha. -ha. Uh, so we face all these major challenges, and there are all these continuing dictatorship and authoritarian regimes. So I think it's very important to not get in, stuck in either or debates, but to rather understand how the new media ecology does and does not facilitate certain kinds of social movements and collective action, what kind of role it can and maybe cannot, you know, understand its limitations too, in having a world in which our connections to each other play a key role in shaping in a way that we collectively want to go. Thank you.